Well, my name is Audrey Mossberger and I'm director of events at the National Bureau of Asian Research. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, PRC Pressure on Taiwan, Same Strategy, New Tactics. We have an exciting keynote speaker, in addition to an expert lineup of panelists, whom I know everyone is anxious to hear from, and so I won't take up too much time here. Now, following remarks by our keynote speaker, and after that, our panel, will open things up to audience Q&A. For those joining us here on WebEx and via live stream, please email your questions to events at nbr.org. You don't have to wait until Q&A starts to send in questions. And in fact, I encourage you to do so throughout the event as you might find your question is addressed. If not, our moderators will do their best to present all questions to our keynote and panelists within the allotted time. Finally, the video recording for today's event will be available on our website at nbr.org either today or first thing on Monday. We are looking forward to a very lively and informative discussion today. And with that, I will turn it over to NBR's president, Roy Kamphausen. Roy, over to you. Thanks, Audrey, and welcome to everyone, wherever you're calling in from, uh, East Coast, US East Coast, or around the world. It's also my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion on PRC's pressure on Taiwan. Since the election of President Tsai Ing-wen in 2016, the PRC has increased its pressure on Taiwan through a variety of actions, including military coercive, economic, and diplomatic pressure. China's coerciveness against Taiwan has continued to intensify in 2021. Beijing is using vaccine diplomacy to drive a diplomatic wedge between Taiwan and its Latin American allies, for instance, while also blocking Taiwan's ability to obtain vaccines. China has also banned the import of Taiwan pineapples, a particularly painful economic coercive measure intended to crater a large export market for Taiwan farmers. And in June, 28 PRC military aircraft, including four nuclear capable bombers, entered Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Yet another escalatory step in military pressure. Taiwan has demonstrated resolve and resilience in the face of China's pressure. Shortly after the pineapple ban, President Tsai Ing-wen stated, from crisis comes turning points. In the face of each challenge, Taiwan will not be defeated, but will become even stronger. And Foreign Minister Joseph Jiaxie Wu, a great friend of MBR, who, who spoke to our board and advisors two weeks ago, has echoed similar state sentiments. In response to China's military pressure, he declared in April, we are willing to defend ourselves without any questions, and we will fight the war if we need to fight the war. And if we need to defend ourselves to the very last day, we will defend ourselves to the very last day. The PRC's course of actions have prompted renewed attention on U.S. Taiwan policy as well, specifically the United States' long-held policy of strategic ambiguity. The experts gathered virtually here today will assess the implications of the PRC's pressure campaigns on Taiwan and possible shifts in China's strategy, the role of the United States, and how Taiwan's strategy is adapting in response. Before introducing our keynote speaker, I'd like to thank my MBR colleagues, Rachel Bernstein, Josh Nizam, Audrey Mossberger, Jeremy Rausch, and Darlene Onuora for their hard work in organizing this, this event. Thanks, team. Congress plays a large role in shaping U.S. policy towards Taiwan, as well as in sustaining the unofficial relationship between Taiwan and the United States. Here at MBR, we continue to support this important relationship and are pleased to be joined by a prominent congressional leader on U.S. foreign policy in Asia to engage with our audience. It's now my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Congressman Ami Berra of California's 7th District. Congressman Ami Berra has represented California's 7th Congressional District in the House of Representatives since 2013. Currently, he's a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation. And he's also a senior member on the House Committee uh, for Science, Space, and Technology. Congressman Berra also serves as vice chair for outreach for the New Democrat Coalition, a group of over 100 forward-thinking Democrats who are committed to pro-economic growth, pro-innovation, and fiscally responsible policies. Thank you, Congressman Barra, for your leadership in the House 
on all things Asia and for joining us today. We look forward to hearing your short remarks and insights, and then we'll have some Q&A. Uh, after his short remarks, I'll follow up with a couple of questions, and then we invite our audience, as Audrey suggested, to submit your questions via email, and they'll be sent to me, and I'll relay them to Congressman Barrett. Congressman Barrett, hey. welcome well, over to you. Well, thank, thank you for um, the invitation. Thank you for having me on, and sorry about some of the technical difficulties logging on, but I think that's probably par for the course in, you know, this new day and age. Um, you know, keep my comments and really have a conversation. But you know, as I think about my chairmanship um, on the subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, and think about the the opportunities, but also the challenges that we face in the region. Obviously, um, you know, the direction that China has taken under Xi Jinping um, certainly is cause of concern. And you know, we we obviously have seen. You know, some of the actions that have taken place over the past few years, whether it's the South China Sea, um, you know, breaking international norms in terms of you know, building these islands, what we've seen in, in Hong Kong, and now this um, assertiveness across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, it certainly has many of us alarmed um, in, in Congress in a nonpartisan way. So this isn't a Democratic or Republican issue. This is an issue that take that Congress takes very seriously and. While a decade ago, we may have hoped that China would move towards a more liberal democratic norm, more open markets, free markets, um, you know, a, a, a culture of entrepreneurship, et cetera, we've seen them go in a very different direction. And at this juncture, as members of Congress, we don't really have to guess what um, China's intentions are because again, Xi Jinping has clearly outlined what his ambitions are. I think in that context, you've seen um, Congress come together. You've seen the Foreign Affairs Committee come together to over the issue of Taiwan. But certainly, um, we're we're here to discuss the importance of maintaining Taiwan's autonomy. You know, the, the island remarkably stable, innovative, um, you know, free market economy, democracy, um, and. Of, of the United States. So it's important to us and part of the reason why we put the Taiwan Peace and Stability Act together as well as the Taiwan Fellowship Act together is we did want to send that signal that the United States stands by Taiwan and you know stands and respects Taiwan's autonomy. Um, in addition, you know, you've seen Taiwan get discussed at, at the G7. You've seen it, you know, you know Certainly, the countries in the region are concerned about Chinese aggression there, and you've seen you know much of our legislation um, get taken up in the the Eagle Act, which we just passed out of the House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee last week, um, and hope to bring to the to the floor of the the full House. Um, I think again, you know, sending a message not just of um, competition and confrontation with China, but also sending a message of what are the rules and norms that will govern the 21st century rules of democracy of, of human rights of free market competition of a, a rules based order again those are all things that are embodied in, in the island of Taiwan but those are things that the United States cares about Japan cares about Korea cares about um, freedom of navigation freedom of movement of goods and services and again China's direction currently stands in opposition of that so I'll, I'll stop with that and let's have a conversation. And I know we got, I got started a little bit late, so I've got about 10 minutes if, if that would work. Thanks, Congressman. You mentioned the Eagle Act. Uh, anything more about it that you'd highlight as it pertains to the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and, and maybe what it signals about growing support in the Congress in addition to the other legislation that you mentioned? Um, no, other than, yeah, we were pleased. No, other than we were pleased that the chairman Meeks, um, you know, took many of the, the provisions that were in the, the Taiwan Peace and Stability Act, you know, in terms of building a, a stronger partnership and looking at you know, Taiwan's ability to defend itself and, you know, what we could do in collaboration with Taiwan to increase its self-defense capabilities to have our DOD, you know, do some assessments as well, you know, and, and you know, elements of the Taiwan Fellowship Act in terms of, you know, taking uh, mid-career um, U.S. government employees and, you know, really building a, an understanding of Taiwan, but also 
uh, of the culture in the region. So all hugely important. In, in what other ways, maybe thinking about our audience, uh, many of whom are, are private citizens and, and we represent the think tank community, what other ways can, can, you, can we contribute to a strengthening of, of U.S.-Taiwan relations in your mind? It seems like the Congress is, is really I leaning that, forward um, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think the Congress is. I think the administration also is. Again, you've seen, you know, whether it's Secretary Blinken, folks on the National Security Council, um, Secretary Austin, you know, Taiwan gets mentioned frequently. Um, and, and again, we're not suggesting that we change the, the one China policy, but what we are suggesting at the, at, is that Taiwan as um, an autonomous region, as a, a democracy has thrived. And yeah, I think one way from the private sector, Taiwan is gonna help the United States address some of our challenges with regards to supply chains. You know, you're certainly see it, seeing it in the semiconductor space. You know, certainly, um, I, I think everyone's anxious for you know, um, some of the, the Taiwanese investments that, that will be coming to the United States. But I think these are ways that the, the public and private sector can you know, certainly um, strengthen the importance of the, the Taiwanese relationship with the United States. And I also think it's important that it's just not the U.S. and Taiwan. I think as we start to look at the um, European Union, as we start to look at other countries in the region, as we have conversations with Australia and New Zealand, China will always say, well, this is an anti-China policy. Um, and it's not. It's a, a policy based on a certain set of core values that we share, values of um, the principles of democracy, of freedom, of entrepreneurship, of a free market system, of um, the freedom of movement of goods and services. And I think that's what brings Democrats and Republicans together, because, again, we've seen the direction China's gone, which is very much an opposite of those values that we share. Congressman, one of the chief challenges Taiwan faces is, is Beijing's efforts to isolate it uh, from participation in international organizations and, and to, to uh, over time, reduce Taiwan's diplomatic allies. <clears throat> COVID response uh, and, and the freezing out, you might say, of Taiwan from the WHO is, is just, I, I think, an egregious exam example. But what, what are your thoughts on this process? How does the United States help in, in uh, against this isolation? You know, so I, I think our absence, the, that being the United States absence in multilateral international organizations over the, the prior <clears throat> administration's four years really left a gap that allowed China to, you know, in a very draconian way, exert its influence. I think that you've seen the Biden administration re-engage in organizations like the WHO um, in the UN and, and elsewhere. I think we have to be at the table. I think we have to um, rebuild multilateral coalitions, again, partnership with the European Union, um, with, with the, you know, others in the region, the, you know, the Australia, India, um, Japan, the Quad, and, and elsewhere. And I think we have to send a message that, um, you know, while we think the actions that happened in Hong Kong were egregious, Taiwan is not Hong Kong. Taiwan's a, a autonomously functioning um, body and you know Chinese aggression towards Taiwan would um, re result in, 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 in certainly a, a different response from the, the Western world. And I think building those coalitions, speaking with one voice, and, and you know in your opening remarks you touched on you know this dialogue that's taking place of strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity. And I'll, I'll often use the term strategic deterrence and. When I talk about strategic deterrence, really deterrence doesn't work without clarity. So I do think working with our allies, working again with the our, our European allies, you know, our allies in Japan, Australia, and elsewhere, I think China needs to understand were it to um, do a direct invasion or even indirect uh, asymmetric uh, towards Taiwan, what the repercussions would be. Uh, I, you know, again, we can't be ambiguous about what that deterrence looks like. It has to be, you know, economic and and you know, additional, and there has to be a, a price that China understands to the world. 
I, I like you, I'm concerned about the ways in which Chinese coercion manifests itself. We've begun a project to look at the ways, the new ways in which the PRC might try to larry or on various types of coercive efforts, right? So uh, military, economic, diplomatic simultaneously and in different, uh, even different ge geographic areas to, to further complicate our own decision making. You've got to go in a minute, but let me ask one last question. Uh, you, you mentioned you've just been in the region. Are you hearing things from our regional partners uh, that that are worth um, us better ha having a better understanding of as it pertains to their sense of what China's motives are, especially vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, but also in the the region more generally? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, you you hear the the concern that um, you know the countries in the region have about China's aggressiveness. You know, we we saw um, you know China's actions in the South China Sea, and you know there is concern if that China may make a miscalculation with regards to Taiwan, um, and you know that that obviously is an existential threat to Japan. You know, certainly um, Korea you know has to worry about that. And while you know they don't necessarily want to get into United States versus China. Battle. I, I think they do have real concerns about. Um, let me use the term that I used earlier: the values that China is putting forth. Again, values of autocracy. You know, you're you're watching actions that are taking place in China, where they're shutting down you know, some of their biggest businessmen and 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 others, and and stifling that free market competition and entrepreneurship. Um, that again, you know, Taiwan's been this economic powerhouse. So I think there is real legitimate concern about Chinese miscalculation with regards to Taiwan um, and the repercussions that could have in the region. Um, and I think that's why it's imperative to the United States, along with our like-minded friends and, and allies and like-valued allies, to send a strong message to China to, to, to really um, deter China from taking unnecessary and um, what I think would be, you know, be the wrong actions and you know again you know we the the region's poised to to thrive if we come out of covid um as is taiwan um and you know i, I think we ought to continue to build these coalitions of countries to further bring taiwan into the fold of um nations and you know again we're, we're not necessarily talking about a change of the one china policy but we are talking about a policy that's you know, served the region very well in the past. Congressman, you've been so generous with your time. You have to go do the, the work of the people. We stand ready as the nation's Asia policy think tank to be a resource to you and your staff. We appreciate your le leadership on these issues, the bipartisan approach, especially to China that you talked about earlier. And so we thank you and wish you all the best. And we're here to be uh, a resource for you. Great. Thank you. Be well. Well, we've had a, a terrific start uh, to our session today uh, with Congressman Barra. Let me now turn to my MBR colleague, Rachel Bernstein, uh, who will moderate our panel of distinguished specialists. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Roy, and thank you to Congressman Barra for your insightful remarks and thoughtful responses. Uh, my name is Rachel Bernstein, and I'm a project manager with the Political and Security Affairs Group at MBR. And it is my pleasure to be moderating this panel today. We are joined by three excellent panelists who will dig into the details of China's military, economic, and diplomatic course of tactics towards Taiwan. Before I introduce the panelists, I just want to say a quick reminder that if you have a question for our panelists, please submit them via email at events at mbr.org. I will now introduce the panelists all at once and in the order that they will be speaking. So Dr. Guo, starting with you. Dr. Guo is an independent political scientist researching international security in East Asia. He is the author of Contest of Initiative, Countering China's Maritime Gray Zone Strategy and Following the Leader, International Order, Alliance Strategies and Emulation. His other research has appeared in International Security, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, the National Interest and the Diplomat, among others. Dr. Guo has previously worked for Ford University, the University of Albany SUNY, the United Nations, the National Democratic Institute, and the Democratic Progressive Party of Taiwan. He holds a PhD and MA from Princeton University 
an MSc from the London School of Economics, and a BA from Wesleyan University. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Minhua Jiang, a research fellow at the East Asian Institute National University of Singapore. She obtained her PhD in economics from Université Pierre Mende, France, now part of the Université Grenoble Alps in France. Dr. Zhang's research interests include Asia-Pacific regionalism, trade and investment, and issues related to economic growth and development in East Asia. She's the author of two books, China-Taiwan Reproachment, The Political Economy of Cross-Strait Relations, and Post-Industrial Development in East Asia, Taiwan and South Korea in Comparison. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Shelley Rigger, the Brown Professor of Political Science at Davidson College. She's the author of Why Taiwan Matters, Small Island Global Powerhouse, Politics in Taiwan, Voting for Democracy, and From Opposition to Power, Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. Her book, The Tiger Leading the Dragon, How Taiwan Propelled China's Economic Rise, was published in June 2021. Dr. Rigger has authored numerous articles on Taiwan's domestic politics, the national identity issue in Taiwan-China relations, and related topics. She holds a PhD from Harvard University and a BA from Princeton University. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Guo, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking today on China's recent military coercion of Taiwan. Uh, I, are these slides on the screen? I can't tell. Oh, there we go, thank you. Okay, um, so yes, thank you again so much for having me come speak today. Um, you know, I want to focus on military uh, coercion and incursions by China, but just keep in mind that this is part of a much larger and broader set of policy tools that China uses against Taiwan. This includes cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, economic coercion, which I'm sure that uh, the other panelists will be just discussing and I'd be happy to discuss later on as well. But today, I want to focus on four questions. Militarily, what is China doing? I think we can best understand this through two lenses uh, that Tom Christensen tends to use. One is either brute force, where you're just trying to conquer the other side. And secondly, coercion, where you actually kind of want the other side's cooperation. You're using military force to get them to do what you want. And so I want to evaluate this, uh, both strategies. Is brute force being effective? Is the use of, of uh, military exercises to coerce Taiwan, is it actually improving Chinese capabilities? Is there a backlash? Similarly so with coerce, the, the coercive side of things. And then lastly, should the United States keep strategic ambiguity or should it jettison this in favor of uh, strategic clarity? Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> just to clarify terms here, brute force, simple conquest. The other side's cooperation doesn't matter. You just want to conquer them. Whereas coercion, you do actually want the cooperation. You're using force, but you want them to get, uh, you want to get them to do what you want. Um, so you kind of need their cooperation as well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and so right now, what is China doing from a brute force perspective? Since at least the 2020 election, we've seen an increase in the scale, sophistication, and norm violating nature of its military exercises. So we're not just talking about, say, limited artillery strikes, or missile launches, but increasingly coordination across multiple units, service branches, and more realistic scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for example, uh, when it comes to Air, for Air Force incursions, last year we saw 380 incursions of Taiwanese airspace. That's the most in any year. Uh, this year, we've already seen the largest number of planes, uh, 28, being launched in single sorties. And this, these are using full wing simulating coordinated attacks, uh, like a, essentially an alpha strike to open the war uh, under these wartime scenarios. Next slide, please. Naval exercises. You know, China regularly conducts mock amphibious invasions, uh, naval exercises. But what's notable about the exercises that have happened this year is that they're practicing support operations for those those, uh, those invasion exercises. Uh, this is the Chinese aircraft carrier, carrier the Liaoning, uh, conducting exercises with Type 55 destroyers, taking the initial steps towards actualizing carrier battle group operations. And they're doing this not just within the Taiwan Strait, but also on the eastern side of the island. So demonstrating a capability to envelop and isolate Taiwan from any sort of third party uh, response. Next slide. Um, and in addition, you're starting to see more combined operations uh, uh, within Chinese exercises. So in 2019, uh, the Beijing held a countrywide all theater command exercise, bringing together the four main service branches, ground force, Navy, Air Force, et cetera, as well as two critical support forces as well. Uh, 
These were in under coordinated, uh, sorry, coordinated operations under a Taiwan scenario to attack both the north and the south of the island simultaneously. Uh, so we're seeing a greater increase in sophistication of what China is able to do, at least simulated. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, some frankly really creative work by the um, by the Chinese military to use civilian transportations modified for military specifications to act as transports for light military vehicles. Um, and so we're seeing like a pretty broad range of military activities focused on Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. But the question is, is this strategy working? And to some extent, there's its unequivocal yes. Uh, China's increasing its conventional and subconventional capabilities and just clearly demonstrating that. But I'd also say that there is, it engenders a strategic backlash. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> You can see on the left hand picture here that there has been an increasing turn uh, against China. So in Taiwan, oh, sorry, this is from the 2019 Pew polls. Um, in, in Taiwan, 61% have an unfavorable view of China compared to 35%. And that opinion is somewhat reflected uh, in throughout the rest of Asia. And currently you're also seeing a, view, a turn towards the United States and with higher favorability ratings as well. Um, next slide. So the region increasingly sees China as a threat, <clears throat> with Taiwan becoming the pivot around which states develop their strategy, whether it's in this case the, uh, the, during the Japanese uh, prime minister's meeting with President Biden or the South Korean leader's uh, president, uh, meeting with President Biden. Both have mentioned Taiwan, I think, in Japan's case for the first time in 52 years, and I'm not even sure how long it's been in, case of, in the case of the uh, South Korea. Uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> so overall, Regional states are seeing Taiwan as indicative of Chinese and U.S. intentions with regard to Asian security, making Taiwan of greater importance to their security decisions. And this is, to some extent, created backlash to this brute force strategy that, while yes, we don't know if this backlash is enough to deter or defeat China in its operations against Taiwan, it certainly complicates Beijing's operational plans and environment by adding more potential combatants. And so, on balance, this might be a net loss for the strategy. Next slide, please. But what about coercion? What if the fact that invasion, even in a bilateral scenario, is politically and militarily risky for China? Perhaps they want Taiwan to capitulate instead of being conquered. Do we see these military exercises, do we see them having a similar sort of uh, efficacy? Uh, next slide. In this case, the coercive purpose, China's coercive purpose would be to get the Taiwanese government or the public to accept unification raise the threat of non-compliance, and normalize its limited sovereign space. Um, <clears throat> but if this, if this is the case, uh, next slide, we're also seeing a backlash to this coercive strategy, where again, there are, by a fairly large uh, margin, there are unfavorable views of, uh, of China within Taiwan, favorable views of the United States. And at least for me, I think the, the biggest indicator is that right now only 4% of Taiwanese identify as Chinese only. Um, if the idea is to lay the political foundations to get the Taiwanese public to accept unification, I think this strategy is clearly backfired. And I think the biggest example of that is, next slide, the one country, two systems, and the kind of the debacle that happened in Hong Kong. This has effectively killed the one country, two systems idea. And so Beijing has given Taiwan lots to run away from but nothing to run towards. And so this is very clearly a failure of coercion, which requires both carrots, sorry, sticks and carrots to be successful. China has been focusing so much on the sticks that it's forgotten that it doesn't really have carrots to entice the Taiwanese over. Next slide. So the last point I wanna discuss is strategic ambiguity. Uh, next slide. Um, and we've had a, a pretty lively debate within the last year, starting out with Richard Haas and David Sachs about whether or not the United States should be uh, jettisoning strategic ambiguity in favor of uh, in favor of strategic clarity. Next slide. And you'll have uh, analysts like Monty Glazer and Mike Mazar saying, well, look, as good as clarity might be, there are strong benefits to keeping the U.S. commitment to Taiwan ambiguous. But we actually have theory that can help us adjudicate this issue. Next slide, please. I'm thinking specifically of Tim Crawford's book, Pivotal Turns from 2008. And in it, uh, sorry, next slide. Um, he argues that under certain situations, the patron, this is the United States, that's A, is concerned about war from all sources, whether that's from the ally, T, Taiwan, or the adversary, C, China. 
And so what it'll do is it'll take its decisive power and just kind of tilt against whoever is being particularly belligerent, belligerent at a particular moment. So if China in this slide right here is saying is, is threatening war, well, the U.S. will take its force and kind of tilt, it, tilt towards Taiwan. Next slide. If the reverse is happening, where, say, Taiwan is threatened to declare independence or threatening conflict, then it'll swing back over to China. But uh, next slide. This theory requires, depends on two critical things. First, both the ally and the adversary have to want conflict, and there's nothing that the patron can do about that. Uh, secondly, the patron has to have decisive power. So it's pretty clear right now, at least to me, that Taiwan doesn't actually want conflict. And it's also clear, especially given these military exercises, that China does. And so U.S. attempts to deter Taiwan are pretty unnecessary within this situation. On top of that, for the second point, the U.S. increasingly does not have that decisive power to tilt the balance between Taiwan and China. As China gets more powerful, in fact, the strategic ambiguity actually encourages aggression. So next slide. So to totally put words into Tim Crawford's mouth, I think the recommendation from his theory is clear that the U.S. should actually be dumping strategic ambiguity and swinging behind Taiwan in a position of strategic clarity. So uh, next slide. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Guo. Uh, really interesting points and some that I look forward to getting more into um, during the Q&A. But um, next, we'll turn to Dr. Zhang. Um, so over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Rachel, for the nice introduction, and, and uh, thank you for having me here today to discuss this very important and uh, tiny issue about PRC's pressure on Taiwan. Uh, so I'm going to spend about 10 minutes of time to look at uh, PRC's pressure on Taiwan from an economic perspective. Um, so can I see my slide, please? Okay, good. Okay, uh, next, next slide, please. So here is the online of my presentation today. So I will briefly introduce, uh, talk about PRC's economic uh, policy towards Taiwan in the last few decades and the resulting uh, economic relations between Taiwan and China. In the third session, I will try to discuss China's pressure on Taiwan uh, from an in economic perspective and uh, what does that mean for the United States and the region. Next, please. And next one. So uh, PRC's economic policy can trace back to the end of the 1970s when China started to open the economy for foreign investment. The capital inflow from Taiwan was one of the most important in supporting China's economic development. So after about 30 years of economic progress, China has accumulated enough economic strength so uh, we see that China started to try to use to enhance its economic presence by encouraging Chinese tourists and the Chinese investment in Taiwan. And this uh, economic presence, enhancing economic presence was facilitated during the time when the KMT government was in office. So the friendly political relations uh, across the trade facilitated this uh, Chinese economic presence in Taiwan. After 2016, when Taiwan took office, China changed its policy towards Taiwan. So China started to exert some economic sanctions on Taiwan um, because the current ruling government in Taiwan does not uh, recognize the 92 consensus. And China used a series of policies, including reducing the number of Chinese tourists and also forcing some Taiwanese friends or artists in China to recognize one China policy. Next slide, please. This one thing I would like to point out uh, is that PRC's policy is important, but it is not the most uh, important. It is not the only factor that affected the cross trade economic um, relations over the past few decades. Uh, in the like, 80s, 90s, uh, Taiwanese firms, they were looking for low-cost production places to bring down their production cost so as to keep their product competitive in the global market. And uh, at that time, the U.S. policy was also in favor of integrating China into the global economy. So as a consequence, um, because China inserted into this um, 
production relations between Taiwan and the United States. So the direct economic linkage between Taiwan and the U.S was fading over the past few decades. And on the other hand, we see that between Taiwan and China and between China and the US, uh, the economic ties has become more and more uh, intensified. Next one. Uh, next, please. However, in recent years, we have witnessed a significant change in Taiwan's investment in China. So about a decade ago, because of China's wage hike, uh, many Taiwanese companies in China, they started to shift their um, factories from China to other developing countries. So we can see a clear, clear, clear drop of Taiwan's investment in China. And uh, the U.S.-China trade war has accelerated this investment shift away from China. And uh, what is uh, very interesting to notice is that in recent two years, more and more Taiwanese manufacturing investment actually went to the United States. So, for example, last year in 2020, over 40% of Taiwan's manufacturing investment went to the United States, followed by China and other developing countries. Next. Despite the investment shift away from China, China still remains as the largest uh, export destination for Taiwan. And the reasons could be that Apple continued to manufacture its devices in China, and Taiwan's industrial upgrading also contribute to Taiwan to increase Taiwan's export competitiveness, especially in the semiconductor industry. And also there is a very strong demand from Chinese branded ICT uh, products such as uh, such as Huawei and Xiaomi, all these um, high technology companies in China, actually they rely on procuring key components from Taiwan. Next, please. So uh, despite the fact that Taiwan and China has very strong linkage in trade, China has never used trade as a tool against Taiwan. As mentioned, the China Chinese companies, they, they are heavily relying on procuring those key components from Taiwan. So if Ch China cuts the investment or uh, ban the import from Taiwan, this will have a uh, uh, tremendous impact on China's economy as well. So instead of saying that Taiwan rely on China for its export-oriented economic growth, it is actually more accurate to say that the cross-trade economic relations is uh, mutual dependence. Next, please. So, so far, what China has used to pressure Taiwan was uh, to restrain the Chinese tourists to Taiwan. However, the effect is quite limited. As we can see on the right hand side figure, the Chinese tourists to Taiwan um, dropped significantly after 2016. Um, but at the same time, the tourists from other countries in Asia has increased. So the total number of foreign visitor arrivals continue to grow before COVID. And uh, on the other hand, China continue to encourage um, either individuals or uh, companies from Taiwan to work or to invest in China. Uh, next, please. So Taiwan government's response is to uh, try to diversify Taiwan's our investment, either uh, back to Taiwan or try to, uh, try to encourage those uh, Taiwanese companies to invest in other developing countries in South Asia or Southeast Asia through the new Southern policy and encourage tourists from other countries and also restrain China's investment in Taiwan. Um, however, as mentioned previously, that PRC's policy is not the only factor that affected the cross-trade economic relations. So similarly, Taiwan's policy would not succeed without being coherent with the U.S. policy and the business demand. Next, please. So overall, China, use, China uses carrot and stick strategy against Taiwan. And so um, unlike, the, um, unlike the limited economic tools that China can exert, China has increased uh, the frequency and the scope of other cohesion policies um, including the military harassment, connective warfare through social media and the cyber attacks to try to pressure the current government. And all these um, 
strategies or these policies, the entire purpose is to destabilize Taiwan politically and economically, to try to make people lose their confidence towards the current administra administration and eventually to um, force the current government to make a compromise with China. Next. So what does that mean for the United States and the region? Next one, please. Uh, there are several implications because of the time limits, so I'm not going to detail each one of them. I just want to say that actually all these implications point to one important uh, issue, that is the loss of the U.S. hegemony if Taiwan was taken over by China. Next, please. We can also understand, try to understand the importance of Taiwan from a geographic perspective. So uh, as you can see, Taiwan is uh, the one with the blue circle. So if Taiwan was um, making a political compromise with China, and uh, we know that China has territory, territorial disputes with many countries in East China Sea and the South China Sea. So the core straight uh, political uh, alliance or unification has very uh, significant implications for these claimant countries in East China Sea and uh, South China Sea. And the unstable situation in these two areas will have profound implication for the stability in the whole Indo-Pacific region. Next, please. So I think uh, in conclusion, China under the current Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping is unlikely to reverse its aggressive policy towards Taiwan. It is only likely to increase uh, their pressure on Taiwan. On the other hand, we also see that on the Taiwan side, uh, the Taiwanese people are unsatisfied with, with their status um, being part of China in many uh, on official or official occasions. So the tense between the uh, Taiwan and China is not likely to decrease in the foreseeable future. So I think that uh, pose a very important question to the United States, that is how to prevent being involved in a direct war with China while keeping Taiwan away from China's pressure for in unification. Um, there are two ways I can think of. The one is to continue to dilute China's economic influence. I think uh, not only to limit the technology transfer to China, but uh, US or European powers uh, greater economic engagement with Taiwan and the region is also very important to dilute China's uh, influence in the region and also try to uh, support Taiwan's economic and uh, diplomatic uh, diversification. Uh, I think my time is up, so I look forward to having more discussions with you in the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, we will now turn to Dr. Shelley Berger for her remarks. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a very interesting conversation so far, so I am actually going to do my notes that I planned, but I'm also going to make a couple of comments on the previous speakers just to um, maybe get the ball rolling a little bit for conversation. So I'm, my job is to talk about China's or, or the PRC's diplomatic policies with respect to Taiwan. So let me begin with the goal of Beijing's diplomatic approach. I think the goal is to deny Taiwan recognition as a separate nation state. Why is it so important to the PRC to deny Taiwan recognition? I think number one is, the, is domestic. So, Domestically, it's very important for the PRC to protect its truth claim about itself and the nature of the PRC as the sole legal and kind of morally uh, legitimate representation of the Chinese nation in the world today. And if you have some people in the world saying, well, you know, maybe there's another China or maybe your concept of the Chinese nation as including basically all of the territories claimed by the Qing dynasty at the height of its power, minus Mongolia and a few other little slivers, um, 
if people outside China are uh, questioning or rejecting that, that truth claim, that definition of what China is, then there's kind of cognitive dissonance, dissonance for people within China. So we're getting one message from our own government, but that's not the message that others are reciting. So what's the truth? What's the real truth? So it's very important to the PRC that people around the world acknowledge that Taiwan is not a, a nation state. So that's number one. Number two, I think, is the uh, imperative for the PRC government to prevent Taiwan from gaining legal independence, right? From taking this arrangement that has been in place since the end of the Chinese Civil War, which is a kind of separation, and turning it into an actual divorce. Right, there's no future possibility of reconciliation because Taiwan has closed the door on that. That is the most serious threat to the Chinese Communist Party leadership, the Chinese Communist Party itself, and the PRC uh, self-definition that, that provides legitimacy for the PRC state. So it's just extremely important to PRC leaders that Taiwan not become independent. And then number three, is to create a norm, a kind of global norm for unification, for the incorporation of Taiwan in some way into the PRC. So these are the goals of uh, Beijing's diplomatic policy. And here's where I want to just take a little detour from uh, my uh, prepared remarks to, to um, disagree with uh, Dr. Guo. I don't think the purpose of the sticks that the PRC is employing in its um, relationship with Taiwan right now, so the military coercion that he very ably um, outlined, I don't think the purpose is to win unification at all. I think they know perfectly well that it is counterproductive, that military pressure is counterproductive to their goal of winning over Taiwanese in a way that would allow them to achieve peaceful unification, which is the goal, according to uh, the most recent statements from uh, Xi Jinping. The goal of the purpose of the military coercion is to deter Taiwan from moving toward independence, and increasingly now today, to deter the US from over engagement or from an, what Beijing perceives as an excessive involvement in the Taiwan issue. So um, I'd be really interested in uh, discussing this further with Professor Guo. You know, um, I have my own uh, IR theory concept for what's happening. I think we are. We see a, we're seeing a security dilemma developing between the US and the PRC uh, in which everything the PRC does is perceived in the US as a move toward coercion and therefore a threat to our interests. And everything the US does uh, in response to what those perceived threats is perceived in the PRC as the US pushing forward Taiwan independence or enabling Taiwanese to imagine that they might be able to secure their independence um, in a formal legal sense. And so the PRC then reacts with, um, with new m measures of its own that we, you know, that the U.S. views as threatening. And so we're in this upward spiral of threat counter threat. I don't think the PRC is looking for conflict. I don't think the US is looking for conflict, but I think this spiral is putting us at greater risk of conflict. And I think it's really important to remember where the conflict will happen, which is in Taiwan. So this security dilemma spiral, if that's what it is, is most dangerous to Taiwan, although it's plenty dangerous to the PRC and the US. Okay, so back to uh, very quickly uh, diplomatic pressure. I think there are, are sort of kind of, for a long time, we've seen two kinds of diplomatic pressure from the PRC, and now we're seeing kind of a new one. The um, 
Long-standing forms of diplomatic pressure are some, some that I'll call perpetual and some that I'll call episodic. So the perpetual ones are the things that the PRC has been doing for decades and continues to do now. Denying Taiwan any new diplomatic partners. So Taiwan is not able to forge diplomatic relations with anyone new. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, there have been a few sort of uh, flips and flip back, but Taiwan has a very hard time um, securing new diplomatic partners uh, because of the PRC's efforts to prevent that from happening. The PRC also has always reacted very strongly against any violation of unofficiality. So if uh, other countries behave in ways toward Taiwan that seem to be crossing the line from unofficial to official or increasingly official relations with Taiwan, they get um, their wrists slapped from Beijing. Uh, another piece of the perpetual approach is no international presence for Taiwan. Um, Taiwan cannot belong to any organization that requires statehood for membership. And this puts a very heavy emphasis on the unofficial and quasi-official relationships that countries around the world, um, perhaps not most notably, but very notably the U.S., have forged with Taiwan. Those relationships have been very effective so far in enabling Taiwan to exist in this um, limited space between you, so complying with the PRC's demand for unification and uh, avoiding what would be a, a very provocative act, which is um, declaring independence. So, as Congressman Barra said, you know, the U.S. is, is not going to change its one China policy because its one China policy is what allows us to maintain this unofficial or quasi official relationship. The episodic or non-perpetual aspects of China's diplomatic pressure are reversing Taiwan's diplomatic partnerships, so poaching away diplomatic partners and blocking even non-statehood memberships for Taiwan. So in the past, Taiwan has been, uh, the PRC has not prevented Taiwan from participating in organizations that do not require statehood for membership. Now, it is. And why, is, why did that change? That changed because the PRC uh, perceived the Taiwanese leadership as changing in its, um, my time is apparently up too, uh, changing its, uh, the, the new Taiwanese leadership, the shift from uh, President Ma ying to President Tsai Ing-wen uh, in, in Beijing's view, meant that Taiwan was no longer securely focused on avoiding independence. And therefore, the diplomatic tools in reserve, reversing diplomatic partnerships and denying Taiwan participation in non-statehood organizations needed to be brought out and deployed. So at the moment, uh, the PRC is maxing out on both its perpetual and its episodic diplomatic tools to suppress Taiwan's international presence. At the same time, they've added a new one, which is extending the pressure from uh, state actors. So telling you know, the US government, the Japanese government, various uh, state actors what they can do to non-state actors. So extending it to um, Corporations demanding, for example, that uh, airlines not use Taiwan as if it were a country name in their um, booking systems, that kind of thing. And, and also, as uh, Representative Barra mentioned, complicating Taiwan's vaccine procurement. So uh, the, the, the diplomatic position, the diplomatic pressure on Taiwan at the moment is really maximal and it ma is making Taiwan's situation very difficult at the same time, though. Um, and this, I think, is related to um, uh, Professor Jiang's comments about the economy. It is also provoking and also Professor Guo's comments about the military. It's provoking a backlash 
from other states that say, okay, this is just too much. This is too far. And it's actually um, enabling Taiwan to increase its, its unofficial diplomacy around the world as uh, states recognize that the pressure on its official and unofficial diplomacy from the PRC continues to intensify. So I will leave it at that and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rigger, and thank you for starting off the discussion as well. I'd like to give Dr. Guo an opportunity to respond to your comments as well as give Dr. Zhang the opportunity to um, add anything to the debate. Um, we have a number of questions coming in and just a reminder that to our participants that if you would like to submit a question, please do, through, do so via email at MBR at events at mbr.org. Sorry, that's events at mbr.org. Um, so Dr. Guo, um, if you'd like to respond, please go ahead. I think you're muted. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, all right, uh, having a little bit of audio trouble, so I hope everyone can hear me. Um, no, I actually generally agree with uh, Dr. Rigger on this, um, <clears throat> that the CCP probably understands, like, they understand that military exercises are counterproductive. I think the major issue is something that I didn't get a chance to really discuss in the slides, which is that the increasing personalization of politics within, the, within China makes these, it, it, to some extent, it makes it kind of a, a, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, because the more that you have centralization of foreign policy within Xi Jinping's hands, the more volatile the policy happens to be, the more tied to his domestic political interests of these foreign policies become. Um, and on top of that, China is clearly developing the capabilities to, if, uh, if, if you know, the leadership decides to go for a, a, an invasion, they could possibly do it, suffering pretty large costs. But, you know, I wonder about the security dilemma, whether or not because the security dilemma is fundamentally based on the idea that both states are defensively oriented, and it's miscommunication or misperception which is causing them to want to fight with each other. And there's absolutely misperception going on, but I'm also not entirely certain that both states are defensive. Um, <clears throat> you know, if we, I tend to think of the, the rules of the road, the liberal international order as kind of setting that baseline for how you determine whether a state is a status quo versus a revision state. And at least in terms of China, it's very clear that they're starting to push at, you know, they've accepted certainly, say, the, the economic underpinning of the liberal international order to some extent. Um, but they have not accepted the territoriality or, uh, or the military underpinnings of the liberal international order. And so in that sense, I'm not entirely certain that we can say that both states are really defensively oriented here. So I'm not sure we're in an actual genuine security dilemma. Um, I can stop there and we can kind of broaden the discussion. We can kind of continue this. But I think it's, it's a really important point as well. How do I... hey, thank you. Um, Dr. Zhang, would you have anything to add? I think I forgot to mention one thing about China's outbound tourism ban. Actually, that also affected uh, its capacity to influence Taiwan through the short-term visitors from China to Taiwan. So overall, actually, the um, uh, economic tools that China can exert are quite limited. So more the more effective way um, to pressure on Taiwan now seems like more in the diplomatic and the military arena. And uh, um, Professor Shelley's comment also inspired me to think about the U.S.-China policy uh, because this um, U.S.-China communique of uh, those kind of agreements over the issue of Taiwan um, was in, was happening in the in the seventies, so it's been over forty years. And the purpose is to maintain the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. But the thing is, now the both sides across the Strait can no longer uh, tolerate the state the so-called status quo. So on one hand, Taiwan is not 
uh, China is not like in the 70s at that, that time. At that time, China was uh, a very weak, still a weak economically weak country, but today China is an economic power. So China wants to do something more that is understandable. And the Taiwan also has been developing its democracy for decades, and there has been a rising uh, Taiwanese identity. So, I mean, the old policy can no longer fit with the current situation. So how the old policy can still maintain its purpose of maintaining a uh, status quo. So I think um, that's the, a, a very important issue that maybe the um, uh, policymakers or uh, scholars can continue to discuss on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with some audience Q&A. Um, our first question is actually for you, Dr. Guo. Um, to what degree do you perceive the growth of theater level nuclear weapon systems as opposed to strategic system systems such as recent ICBM silo construction as affecting strategic stability in a standoff over Taiwan? Uh, great question. Um, <clears throat> theater nuclear weapons versus uh, strategic weapons. I mean, <clears throat> so at least in the strategic level, I'm not sure how much the, the additional silos actually matter that much. The U.S. still has numerically just far, far more than China does. Uh, so 100 silos here and there, eh, you're talking about not that much, money, or, you know, not that much at this point. Um, but in terms of theater nuclear weapons, I mean, I think China still is sensitive to international public opinion. So the use on China's side of theater nuclear weapons would be just pretty bad overall. I don't know if they would want to violate the nuclear taboo. Um, I, I tend to think that, at least in my mind, the 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 kind of, there's no real bright line between like tactical theater or strategic nuclear weapons. Um, just the fact that like we we often think there might be, or at least in sort of popular fiction there is. I think back to like Tom Clancy novels, but there really is no one experience with this sort of bright line. And then two, uh, any data broader data support how you know the psychology behind it. So, you know. If there is no bright line, that's a big assumption, I recognize on my part, then it doesn't really affect things that much simply because you can always escalate to the strategic level. We don't want to escalate to the strategic level, but that possibility is there and so it tends to mute the influence of more tactically or theater-based uh, nuclear weapons. Great, thank you. Um, Kind of switching gears a bit, um, but this question is actually for Dr. Rigger. Um, to what degree do you perceive the more aggressive posture of the PRC with regards to military action over the last two years as a product of the need to appease more hawkish factions within the CPC, as opposed to a policy created to shape opinion in Taiwan and the United States? And I'd welcome other panelists' thoughts on this question as well. Yeah, certainly. Um... So if I if my premise is that the PRC is not seeking conflict, and that uh, Xi Jinping has staked his legitimacy on ensuring that Taiwan does not challenge the truth claims of the Chinese Communist Party, then it makes sense that. Uh, Xi Jinping would do everything possible to deter Taiwan independence. So, uh, and and part of that is, in fact, appeasing those within the PRC, hawkish elements in the in the leadership, perhaps, but also hawkish elements, nationalistic elements in the society. Uh, yes, they need to be appeased. They need to be confident that Xi Jinping is not going to go soft on this issue because this is. This is a, you know, denying Taiwan independence is a foundational goal of the Chinese Communist Party leadership. They have baked it into their statements for decades. So I don't know that um, they're, you know, I don't know that it's specifically aimed at like hawks in the PLA or hawks here or there. Um, you know, I think a lot of, I think it's possible that in the PLA, the thinking is, um, our job is to deter a situation in which we will have to go to war because militaries, generally speaking, don't want to fight. 
So they have a military mission of deterrence of Taiwan independence and deterrence of US support for or encouragement of Taiwan independence. So I don't know whether, you know, I don't know exactly who the hawks are who are being appeased, but yes, I think that that's part of it, the domestic um, politics component. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I welcome any other panelists' comments on this question as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think with uh, Xi's consolidation of power in, say, you know, 2016, 2018, he definitely consolidated power, but he also got a bunch of people within the CCP very, very angry. And so this is kind of what I mean by the personalization of, of, of foreign policy and politics within China is that it, as, the, as the consolidation of power occurs, he's also having to worry about his domestic flank, that there are people with some degree of political power within China who are just not happy with the fact that the party is no longer a moderating force upon the political leadership or less of a moderating force. And so one response to that is to drum up nationalism to, uh, I don't know if I, I agree with Dr. Rigger, I don't know if, if he really needs to appease the PLA. In fact, I think it's kind of the opposite, that he needs to uh, appease those parts of the, the national public or within the CCP that aren't necessarily part of the PLA, but do have this sort of more aggressive foreign policy, this, or view of foreign policy, this belief that uh, the United States in particular is kind of on its back, and so now is the time to kind of take advantage of that. Um, and because he doesn't have the institutional checks that the CC, the party itself provides, he has to then rely upon these more appeals to nationalism, appeals to public opinion, appeals to kind of being the, I don't, I don't quite want to say cult of personality, I don't think it's quite gotten to that point, that sort of personal standing and stature, which the um, military uh, kind of waving your stick around, it kind of can help with that sort of process. Great. Uh, Dr. Zhang, would you like to um, touch on this topic as well? I have nothing to add on the military issue. Thank you. Great. Um, so a couple of you and your presentations have discussed um, kind of Taiwan's international support growing among like the EU and in the US. And I guess, what would you say um, the effect of growing international support for Taiwan and kind of increasingly um, increasing backlash in the PRC or towards the PRC for their course of tactics towards Taiwan? Do you think that this has been kind of a successful strategy or is there anything um, Sorry, um, how effective is this rising unofficial international support for counteracting Taiwan's lack of official support um, internationally? So I was thinking if um, EU or uh, United States or other countries can have more economic engagements with Taiwan that will uh, help Taiwan to decrease its dependence on China. Uh, for example, uh, not long time ago, China banned Taiwanese agricultural food at uh, pineapple. So if Taiwan has FTA or other uh, economic relations with other countries, so we don't need to uh, worry about China's um, sudden ban of certain goods uh, imported from Taiwan. And also, I think the big powers should also have more, engage more engagement, economic engagement with the region we know that China has increased its influence in the region through the BRI in recent years. Um, so uh, we see that some of the European countries, they are involved in the military um, uh, um, uh, practice in this region in recent years, but I don't see any um, clear, any significant economic engagement from those European countries with uh, Asian countries. So I think uh, for the economic engagement, it is also a way to dilute China's influence because China has quite actively using its economic power, uh, especially for the de developing countries in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I definitely um, agree. 
uh, with Dr. Jiang. The the substance what in order to avoid the backlash becoming damaging to Taiwan, because you know there's there's a real danger here. Um, if the PRC perceives the world lining up against it in favor of Taiwan, Taiwan will be the target of the punishment. You know, they 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 yell at the U.S. They we have unhappy meetings with PRC officials, but Taiwan actually gets real meaningful measures taken against it. Um, so, what I would agree with uh, Professor Jiang that what we need to be, what how you how the world can avoid this backlash actually becoming harmful to Taiwan is by making sure that our actions are substantive and that they're really high value for the the risk that they contribute rather than symbolic. So I think economic cooperation is huge. Throughout the entire Trump administration, um, people with views like mine kept saying, you know, all of this talking that, that the Trump administration is doing that is so pro-Taiwan is completely erased by one single action stepping away from uh, TPP because TPP was the mechanism that Taiwan was going to be perhaps possibly able to use to avoid economic marginalization. So all the talking in the world couldn't make up for killing the one, you know, blowing up the bridge that Taiwan might have been able to cross into um, multilateral economic uh, relationships or, or organizations. So um, it's really, and, and we never saw TIFA talks resume under the uh, Trump administration until the very last days, even though uh, President Tsai had made a huge political sacrifice almost a year ago in August of 2020 um, on boar, beef and pork. So we need to do the substantive things. The economics is really important. The GCTF, the Global Cooperation Training Forum, um, which is a U.S. Taiwan cooperative program is really good. Building and leveraging U.S. alliances is very helpful. Um, these are substantive moves um, rather than symbolic ones. And just one last point. This is why I am against strategic clarity, because strategic clarity is just words. It's throwing words into the void. I don't think it changes the way the PRC does its military planning because they have to do their military planning on the assumption that the U.S. will intervene because that's a possibility. So they've got to take that into account. So we just throw away our own flexibility in what is a very empty gesture uh, as it's received in Beijing. So symbolic stuff like that seems to me to be likely to provoke punishment of Taiwan without actually gaining anything. But there are a lot of things we can do that are beneficial to Taiwan in a substantive way. So I mostly agree with what uh, Dr. Rigger and Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Zhang have said. I think I'd add, yeah, and absolutely, getting back into TPP or some kind of economic and production coordination is absolutely vital for Taiwan. In terms of the military side, you know, when I think about the Japanese and the Korean summit meetings, the summit state, with Biden. Yeah, they both mentioned Taiwan, but the big question is exactly how is Taiwan being incorporated to those security plans? Is it just that Japan and South Korea on their own say, okay, yeah, we're going to try to start thinking about them, bring them in, or does Taiwan have an unofficial seat at the table in some way? Are they actually there present and, dis and having an exchange of dis uh, discussions with their counterparts in, say, the Ministry of Defense? Um, <clears throat> how are they being incorporated to these, these overall plans? And so this is where I think I would actually disagree with Dr. Rigger about strategic clarity, because I agree with her. Strategic clarity, you know, China very understandably is engaged in a sort of worst case scenario plan. Strategic clarity is not for China. Strategic clarity is for Taiwan. <laughs> Taiwan can't make security plans as easily or as clearly in the absence of a U.S. guarantee. Now, we can modify the guarantee. We can say that it does not apply in cases of if Taiwan decides to declare independence. But ultimately, the reason why strategic clarity is important is not just for the statement, but because it unlocks um, the possibility set for Taiwan. And in addition, I think this is pretty important, it unlocks the institutions 
that allow for deeper coordination. That book over there, the kind of weird multicolored one, uh, that'll be released, I think, on Tuesday, and it discusses how we think about alliances right now um, and how coordination and planning is the kind of generally accepted solution to this sort of uncertainty. So when we talk about ambiguity and say, oh, we can get the benefits, it's, it's kind of being, uh, it only, it, all it does is antagonize China. I'm like, yes, probably does. But the concurrent benefit is that, A, you establish your credibility vis-a-vis -vis your own allies. And then, uh, that's it, A. B, um, <clears throat> you actually can start establishing the coordinating processes, especially on a multilateral basis, that will be the real way you're able to coordinate policy, to deal with sort of unexpected events, and try to reduce that uncertainty over the medium and longer. Um, so, Dr. Rigger, you kind of touched on action, or all of you really touched on actions that the U.S. can take or that other European countries are taking um, in terms of international support for Taiwan. But what are some actions that Taiwan can take itself in the face of growing coercion um, across diplomatic, economic, and diplomatic and military domains? Yeah, so, um, you know, one thing that Taiwan is already doing and that uh, Professor, uh, Professor, <laughs> President Tsai is really dedicated to is strengthening its own domestic defensive capacity. And I think that is hugely important. Um, it's important for the confidence of Taiwanese civilians so that they uh, recognize that uh, whether or not, you know, that, that there will not be a U.S. military response that is capable of handling the first wave of, a, of an attack, an, an actual full out attack on Taiwan. So Taiwan has to be able to withstand a pretty heavy blow on its own while the US uh, decides whether to, or, or just having already decided, you know, gets its act together and gets there. So in the absence of confidence among the people that there is in fact, that the Taiwan is defensible, the uh, domestic politics and the domestic uh, willingness to resist is diminished. If people are not confident that they are that they that they can defend themselves and they can be defended effectively, then there will be a much bigger political debate about whether or not to uh, surrender to this kind of coercive activity. So it's really important that Taiwan has that it is defensible and that it is defensible in a way that's visible and legible to Taiwanese civilians so that they have the confidence to go forward into the, the worst case scenario with um, the same kind of conviction that uh, Foreign Minister Wu expressed when he said, you know, we will fight to the last day. Um, the way Another thing that worries me about strategic clarity is that military spending and military preparedness are already very political and controversial issues within Taiwan. And I worry that an unqualified security commitment from the U.S. will make it even more difficult for Taiwan's leaders to persuade their own population to invest in and invest not only money, but invest you know, human lives, like people making a career in the military is very important. If you have an iron, excuse me, an ironclad unconditional security guarantee, why would you invest in those things? So we've, the U.S. has been encouraging Taiwan for decades to do more. And I think making it clear that they have to do that in order to have the kind of backup that they expect from the U.S. is important. It's important in U.S.-Taiwan relations. It's also important in the domestic politics of military spending and military preparation in Taiwan. Um, I'd like to give the other panelists a chance to respond. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I fully agree. I think um, Enhancing Taiwanese defense, I mean, I think in particular that the move of the kind of ending of conscription and moving to an all volunteer army, or sorry, uh, armed forces was not handled very well. Um, and there, it's just, 
you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the people now entering the military are going towards the more reserve or support, or sorry, uh, support forces, uh, command forces as opposed to the frontline forces. And that's a real problem when it comes to Taiwan's ability to actually defend itself. Um, and I fully agree with Dr. Rigger that like, this is a really tricky political question. Nobody wants to go back to conscription. And yet, at the same time, nobody really, I think, wants to make the investments to make the volunteer uh, armed forces work as effectively as they need to in order to defend themselves against China. Uh, I think the problem is this, though. <clears throat> we, we've been you know, going back and forth on strategic clarity, but I think I, I just mentioned a couple things. One, no guarantee is conditional. Even NATO is not conditional. The United States views the NATO Article 5 uh, of commitment as once an attack happens, Congress and the executive will decide, and then we will determine whether or not we want to go in. And so we can always make a commitment uh, that has conditionality to it or ambiguity to it. Um, it just depends on what that conditionality and ambiguity is going to be and whether the clarity it affords is offsets uh, any sort of reaction uh, in against the by China and also the reaction in Taiwan. And on that reaction in Taiwan, right now the strategy, especially with you know, Taiwan, is kind of in the middle between shifting to sort of a, what Hunziker and Lanoska call a denial and depth sort of strategy, it's kind of a porcupine strategy. Uh, but before then, these sort of high profile purchases of F 16s uh, that will be pretty instantly shot down, <clears throat> at least in my mind, this is uh, sort of a prestige idea. That unless if you can shoot if you can let China shoot down a premier American weapon system, then the U.S. will come in because their prestige and status is involved. That also seems like a really bad strategy. Um, and so I agree in the sense that like yes, you know, the United States is pushing Taiwan to do more. Although I'll, I'll also uh, note that the U.S. expects all of its allies to do more and never really defines what exactly doing more actually is. Um, except in the case of NATO with the 2 to 4% of GDP, all the rest of that. Um, but um, currently the strategy that Taiwan is pursuing is not changing for the better. And what you do is you exchange a commitment for that improved, uh, improved effort. Right now, Taiwan doesn't have as much of an incentive to actually increase its effort because it doesn't know if the United States is actually going to show up. Why invest in deplete the political capital of saying to your people that, hey, you might all be killed if the, it increases the chance the United States shows up by 1%, 2%, if you don't even know what the benchmarks are for the United States showing up. And this is why I think strategic clarity matters much more for Taiwan than it does for China, because it unlocks this choice that right now is just not going to happen. Yeah, I guess I just don't understand why uh, an ambiguous clarity is better than ambiguity. But um, I think you probably have other questions. So we can... Yes, we probably have time for one more question. Um, and I know we're, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll ask that you make your answers quick, despite the fact that this is probably a very complex question, but um, it's been much debate over the past few months of whether or not military conflict um, is inevitable, um, or if we're heading, if China and Taiwan are heading towards military conflict due to Xi Jinping's linkage of Taiwan unification with the great reunification of rejuvenation of the Chinese nation by 2049 and the death of one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Um, I would just love to hear your thoughts on whether or not we are, they are heading towards military conflict. I can answer fast. No, um, I don't think that uh, the premise of the question is correct. I don't think that we have proof or strong evidence that those things are linked. Um, I think deterring it, Taiwan independence is hugely important. Deterring the U.S. from acting in ways that will increase the likelihood of Taiwan independence is hugely important to the PRC. But uh, unification by force, I don't see a deadline. I don't see any reason to assume or act on the assumption that that is inevitable. Sure. Uh, so can I take a cop out answer saying I don't know? <laughs> I think <clears throat> the major issue for me is, um, is the personalization of politics within China. It's harder to know. It, it just in personalistic, personalistic dictatorships, foreign policy becomes more volatile. Uh, and so while I think 
you know, I, I agree that intentional war is unlikely. Accidental war, that is what really concerns me. That there are these sort of, whether or not it's like the United States does something and encourages Taiwan to go independent and we get ourselves to war because of the sort of, uh, what's that game, telephone? My kids play, I can't remember. Um, you know, that, that kind of game where you're not, you're not talking to each other, you're not being very clear. Or it's because of some sort of domestic political incentive, either on Taiwan, China, or maybe even the United States' part to like want to push for this. Um, that sort of personalization of, of foreign policy within China really worries me because then the, the triggers become down to almost like the single individual and what that person has in his head at the time. Do they have a bad breakfast to some extent? Um, whereas the institutional checks that you see in Taiwan and the United States are helpful in kind of pushing against that, um, I, I just don't know. I think the, the, the risk of conflict increases as we get more personalization of, of foreign policy with that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zhang, I'd like to give you the opportunity to um, answer this question as well. Uh, can I have an economic comment? Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. I just want to follow up what, what I have uh, said previously. I think U.S. and the EU are very important and the representative um, uh, economies in the world. So if they could have any FTO economic cooperation uh, with Taiwan, I think uh, it's easier for other countries to follow and uh, uh, to help Taiwan to diversify its economic relations is not only uh, for Taiwan, but it is also for the United States and the whole world because we know that Taiwan holds the most important technology in the world in semiconductor industry, which can be widely used in space industry, in military, all kinds of high tech uh, products. So um, China can use all the ways to acquire this technology from Taiwan. So I think uh, keeping Taiwan um, distant from China economically is very essential. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are at time. Um, this is a wonderful discussion. I'd like to thank all three of our panelists for joining us today.